Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about a mystical, mythical creature who lives deep in the psyche called the Selkie. The Selkie uh, is a mythology that comes from northern realms of Iceland, Ireland, Scotland, where there are seals. And there are many, many stories about seals that can remove their skin and become human. Half human, half animal, lives in the water, our universal symbol for the unconscious. And so today we are going to talk about what is a Selkie and how does that live in our human psyche. And to start, um, after we hear a little bit, uh, more here, Lisa will read a classic tale about a Selkie so that we all have a base from which to mm-hmm. join in this discussion. And before we jump into the fairy tale about the Selkie, which is this remarkable and magical figure that can transform from a seal into a person and mm-hmm. back again, mm-hmm. I'd like to talk to you about becoming our supporter on Patreon. And you see, it's just like the tale of the Selkie. (laughs) You can magically transform into being a patron and then back into your normal life, and then to a patron and then back into your normal life. So what we'd like you to do is put on the magical skin of the patron and turn into a remarkably generous magical creature. (laughs) At that point, you would go to thisjungianlife.com and with your flipper, tap the <laughs> I'd like to be a patron button. Which is under podcast. Under podcast. And it'll open our Patreon page. And with those little flippers, you can <laughs> jump right in and with your sea treasure, go right in at the highest level, which is $25 a month. And for that, we do a special dream interpretation for people at that level a couple times a month. But more importantly, fellow Selkies, (laughs) this keeps us free of corporate sponsorship. And just like the Selkies that can't wait to find their skin and jump back into the ocean, we too would like to retain our freedom. (laughs) So we can do that if you share a little bit of your undersea treasures so become our patron and let me know whether this style of requesting donations really works or not we'll have to see if we get an influx of patrons after this episode or if people suddenly cancel their their, their support it's like, i don't know i think, I think people it's want f- to become magical magical everybody wants to be a shapeshifter i suppose okay well Without further ado, I'm going to read um, an, an original version of the story because that's what I I like to do that when I'm working with stories. I like to go back to the the most. I mean, right? All of these were written down. They're part of an oral tradition, and someone wrote them down at some point. So, but but I do try to look for the the kind of purest version that I can. Um, there's a wonderful series of fairy tales called Sur la Lune Fairy Tale Series, and uh, they're edited by Heidi Ann Heiner, and I'm, I have a bunch of them. The, um, the Mermaids one that I'm going to read from, I only have in Kindle, so I, I'm not going to hold it up, but this is the Rapunzel one, and, and you can see mm. it just has, it just, I mean, it has, you know, that many Rapunzel stories in it. Wow. 
So yeah, some of them are really, really thick and, and they're great. Anyway, okay, so that's what I'm reading from. I'm reading from the volume on mermaids and uh, here it is. It says, a typical story of an encounter with the Selkie folk and what came of it is that of a guideman of Wastness in Shetland. I probably pronounced that wrong, forgive me. This young fellow who had successfully withstood the blandishments of the maidens of the countryside and had escaped the toils of their mamas, one day came upon a group of Selkie folk sporting on a rock by the shore. Creeping forward, he secured the sealskin nearest him before its proper owner could reach it and set off home with it over his shoulder. Before he had gone far, he heard a pitiful wailing behind him and looking round saw a beautiful girl following him, weeping dolefully. This, as he rightly conjectured, was one of the selkie folk whose sealskin he had seized and who was unable to escape owing to the want of it. Timorously she approached and tearfully she begged the restoration of her property so necessary to her. The young crofter, struck by her beauty and winsomeness, refused to meet her wish unless she consented to become his wife. After some persuasion, he succeeded in wringing from the sea maiden a reluctant consent, and she accompanied him home. A thrifty, frugal, and kindly good wife, too, did she turn out, and the birth to them of seven children, four boys and three girls, seemed to leave nothing lacking for her happiness. But often the mother would turn away from her children and gaze with a longing, faraway look in her eyes at the sea. The sealskin she had never seen since the day she came as an ocean bride. One day when her, eld her husband and eldest sons were away at the fishing and she was left in the house with only the youngest child, who had been ill, an overpowering desire came over her. High and low she hunted for the missing skin, but she was unable to find it. She was on the point of giving up the search in despair when the child said she knew where her father kept an old skin bundled up. Sure enough, this proved to be the identical article for which she was seeking, and slipping away from her child with it clasped close to her arms, she made quickly for the beach. Arrived at the water's edge, no time was lost in putting on the skin, and with a glad shout she sprang into the sea. Swimming rapidly towards a group of seals not far distant, she was greeted with warmth on her return to her kith and kin. The demonstrations of a large male seal, which had been often noticed in the neighborhood, being particularly marked. Just then, the guideman happened to be returning home from fishing, and as his boat sailed past, what was his astonishment to hear himself addressed as followed: "Guideman of Wastness, fare thee well. I like thee well. You were good to me." but I love better the man of the sea. When he arrived home, he found it was no trick that was being played upon him, and what his youngest child had to tell soon enlightened him as to the manner in which he had lost his helpmeet. Distracted, he hunted the seashore for several days and nights, but never a trace did he again see of his sulky wife. Mm -hmm. So maybe I'll just start by saying I included a version of this tale in my book, um, Motherhood Facing and Finding Yourself. And when I give talks about the book or talk to people who've read the book, this is the thing I most often hear is, oh my God, that story. So many women mm -hmm. relate to that story in some way. And one of the reasons I really love it is because I feel like there are many different ways that we can uh, understand it. It, it. Lots of different ways to understand it. And they all work and they don't necessarily uh, agree with each other. So there's a wonderful kind of richness and paradoxicalness to the story. Mm -hmm. I don't think paradoxicalness is a word. <laughs> <laughs> it is now. <laughs> the urban Dictionary, here we come. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just uh, thinking about uh, how the metaphor and images of of drying out uh, really illustrate this. Of here's a water creature uh, who 
who is up on dry land and, and doing earthly things. Uh, a crofter is a small holding farmer. So I'm imagining, you know, lots of earthy stuff of, of you know, helping to grow crops and get your hands in the dirt. And certainly, I mean, she in this version has seven children and the number of children varies, but of how motherhood, as wonderful as it can be, also takes us away from ourselves. And that image of a kind of drying out with, you know, one consideration, duty, attunement, uh, selflessness of, of that's involved in taking care of children, you know, versus putting back on her own skin and diving into the depths mm -hmm. of her own true nature that's not related to duty, work, relationship, child rearing, cooking, housework, all of that. And, um, and how much women that you talk to resonate to this tale. Mm -hmm. I, I think there is a way that uh, wifehood, motherhood, home duties, and still every survey that's taken says women do more of home tending, child rearing, various kinds of house and family oriented work than, than men do. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the cost of, of that? And yet what's sad about the tale is that it's either or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much. You know, then there is a final leaving. She simply leaves mm -hmm. uh, instead of a way to combine both. So there's a sadness in a way, I think, to the tale. It is. I think it is a sad tale. It seems in the loss of soul, which is somehow connected to the loss of the seal skin, that if it was possible to visit the seal skin and return to one's natural environment in some cyclic way, then one might come back refreshed, rehydrated, mm. <laughs> so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. It seems that the damage might be done, not so much that the seal skin has been taken off for some amount of time, but that it's separated and kept away from the selkie for mm -hmm. too long. Mm -hmm. And I think that the culture, perhaps our own egos that are very driven and determined and focused, even forget where they've stored or locked up the seal skin. Mm -hmm. Maybe start to believe that it was just a dream and they didn't used to really even have a seal skin <laughs> until some late midlife process sets them in hunt mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. I think for many of us, that instinctive feeling of being in the right skin might be lost even in childhood as we're acculturated in ways that could be very different mm -hmm. from our natural personality. Mm -hmm. In the fairy tales, they're, they're older, mature men and women selkies. But it seems to me that psychologically it might happen at an even younger age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is so poignant, this image of the loss of the skin that is kept mm -hmm. away from her. And it's puzzling in the, in the fairy tale that the crofter keeps it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get rid of it. You know, they're, they're, oh gosh, I, I feel like I could, I don't have so much to say on this, but, but there are a lot of tales that fall under the heading of kind of animal bride or bridegrooms, right? They, they're people that marry frogs and <laughs> um, birds and all kinds of creatures. And often there is this skin element and um, in some of them that end happily, I would say that this one doesn't end happily. It doesn't have a very sort of satisfying lysis as it were and it and it doesn't we don't feel like oh great it's 
good ending. Everyone left mm-hmm. happily ever after. We're like, what about those poor traumatized children whose mother left them? Right. Um, th- this one, uh, you know, it doesn't doesn't feel very finished. The ones that do feel finished often involve a destruction of the skin, usually by fire. Mm-hmm. So usually the human partner throws the skin in the fire, and sometimes it's a man, and sometimes it's a woman. And, and that seems like this great violence, but it's interesting because fire as a, as a, an image is, is when something burns, it's complete, it's actually chemically transformed. So it really changes state. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, uh, an image of transformation. There is no transformation in this fairy tale. There is a stasis and a going back. And, and I think that tells us something about what psychological ground we're in here, or at least one of the ways to understand it. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering about uh, where the element of choice uh, comes in, in, in these versions, that uh, the women come up and they dance upon the rock or they, you know, some, some man, and it's often the females, uh, and that the man looking upon them is just, uh, falls in love with these beautiful creatures. And he takes a skin. And then, uh, you know, really he holds the woman or the selkie in her female a human form hostage to basically come come up onto dry land, come to earth and bear children and and do all of that. Uh, but but there ha- she has not chosen it. She has not assented. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it uh he promises, you know, if you'll come and stay with me for uh, seven years or some period of time, and then if you want, you can go back, but just do it for a while. So there's, it's as if there's a contract for <laughs> kind of being indentured. Um, but then after the time has elapsed, he doesn't want to give it back. So it's an interesting tale about um, on two levels. One is you know sort of in the in the so-called real world. Um, what happens to women in in marriage and motherhood? But on the other side is uh, how does that happen in the psyche? Um, how do we leave our own skins behind? Well, um, uh, you know, as I said before, one of the things I really like about this tale is it can be interpreted on different levels, and I think each level has its own richness. I mean, when you think about this story and the lives of women in, say, you know, pre-modern Europe, where that was pretty much it. You got married and you had kids, and it didn't really matter if you uh, were a free spirit or if you had tremendous talent in music. It's like that, you know, that this was the option. And so I, I think the level that you're talking about it, Deb, about almost being like an indentured servant and there's really no choice and other things really get sort of plowed under by this agenda, uh, I think that it it pretty accurately reflects the lives of women, certainly in the past and to an extent even today. And mm-hmm. Certainly this is more true uh, for some of us and others. I mean, Deb, I think you said a minute ago it's either or. And luckily, you know, many women in the Western world, at least, it's not quite so either or anymore, I would say. There, there is an opportunity to craft, uh, you know, some time in the open ocean, and then you go back to your kids. Um, so that's, that's a lovely thing, but I still, I still think that the suffering portrayed or hinted at in this story is very, very real. But, but you're saying, how does that happen in the psyche? I think mm-hmm. when we see it as a purely psychological tale and less like a sociological tale, yes. the meaning really changes kind of drastically. If we think about it uh, as a dream, as a dream that a single person is having, which could either be a man's dream or a woman's dream, 
something or some part of us that used to be one with the primal ocean, an extension of the Great Mother, is beginning to differentiate. Because the Selkies are able to, by choice, come to the shore, by choice, set aside their skin, and to play and to walk mm -hmm. in human form, ostensibly because it pleases them. Because there is something novel about being able to move through that liminal space and know oneself in such a different and profound way. Mm. But there hasn't been a choice to reside fully in that human world. And so after some amount of time, there is a return to the seal form and then a return to the Great Mother. Mm -hmm. So there's something here about growth and autonomy and agency and then regression back into the more ancient place. Many fairy tales also look at this transition between an animal state and a human state. For instance, in the ancient story of the Queen of Sheba, which I believe is uh, part of the Ethiopian version of the Bible, the Queen of Sheba is said to have legs that are hairy and goat-like, and in some, <laughs> in some depictions they literally are goat legs. Solomon comes to the Queen of Sheba, they fall in love ostensibly, and then Solomon introduces her to Kabbalistic wisdom, to this evolving process, and through his philosophy and magical and religious influence, her legs transform into human legs, mm. which in that story is seen as a curative process. But so much of the evolution of humanity, both in terms of civilization and in terms of personal development, has been this differentiation from the unconscious, which is often symbolized by animal-like behavior. And the mm -hmm. whole system of ethics, for instance, and law, differentiates us from our own animal natures, that we don't take offense if a lion attacks a gazelle and kills it and gobbles it up. We can feel sentimental about it, I certainly do, when I see that on these wilderness shows. But we don't think of the lion as a criminal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but in human society, even though we may have leonine qualities in ourselves, we take a very severe stance about whether humans are permitted to be possessed by lion-like qualities and act that way. We, we won't have it. Mm -hmm. We expect the animality in ourselves to be contained, but I think what fairy tales and what Jung was saying, we can't kill off the great beasts that maraud mm -hmm. in our organs and ourselves, that we have to be able to contain them and perhaps transmute them. And I think that's one of the challenges of the movement from the Selkie to the human, but also the challenge of whether or not or how one can set aside the animal part of ourselves. And I think the Selkie myth is trying, incompletely perhaps, to address this question. So one of the things that we can imagine, Joseph, in, in all of these images of something animal getting humanized is that there's a coming, there's a movement from something that's unconscious and instinctual to something mm -hmm. that is conscious. And so, you know, you started off by saying if we looked at this as a dream, and, and I would say that, you know, we use the same precept uh, in looking at fairy tales that we do in dream work, which is we generally assume that everything in the fairy tale is an image of a single psyche. 
Mm-hmm. So if you look at it like that, then the selfie is not being captured by uh, you know some patriarchal man. But it, there's something in her own psyche. If we and you're right, we could we could we could interpret this as if it were the psyche of a, the crofter. And that would be a very different story. But if we're going to assume, and we could actually try to do that, that would be cool. <laughs> but if we're going to assume right now that we're sort of interpreting it from the standpoint of the Selkie psyche, we would say that the crofter is an inner masculine energy. I mean, in classical Jungian formulation, we would call that the animus, but we, we might see it as a kind of function that is inviting her to settle down. The interesting thing about this story is that it started off saying that he had escaped the blandishments of the country lasses. So he was sort of uh, avoiding settling down, but then he finds the selkie and it kind of constellates this desire. It's like, let's root. The thing about being in the open ocean is that there's no fixed form. And, mm-hmm. and that is a kind of Puella stance. Puella is the Latin word for girl, and it was one of Jung's ideas that some of his... Uh, colleagues wrote about extensively, there's a time and a place in our lives, usually when we're young, where we don't know what we want to be. We don't know who we want to marry. We want to keep all of our options open. Totally appropriate. At some point, you have to commit to being a certain version of yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that means picking a career. You might buy a house. You might get married. Every time we do that, we close a whole bunch of doors. And if you think about it, you probably know someone who kind of avoided those things. You know, that that person, that friend that just never got married, that never really picked a career, who's been kind of hopping around. And maybe when we're in our 30s or our 40s and we're bogged down with, you know, three kids in a minivan, we look at that friend (laughs) and we think, oh, God, you know, that looks so good. But, But usually those people don't wind up being too fulfilled later in life. You can't stay young forever, even if you try. And life has a way of catching up with you. So I think we are required to kind of, Marie-Louise von Franz talk about it, so, sort of, talks about it as sort of coming into a three-dimensional space and time reality. We have to yeah. kind of grow down and, and, become, and become one version of ourselves. So many possibilities we could have lived, we can't live them all. I think... One way to understand being a Selkie is you're staying in that realm of endless possibility. You're you're in the ocean. You could be a seal. You could be a human. You're in Mm -hmm. the unconscious. So the movement up and out onto land, that's okay. That's interesting. There's a little bit of growth maybe. There's some consciousness. The crofter is an inner energy that says, come on, let's let's settle down. Let's become something. Mm -hmm. Let's become, you know, sort of real. Let's become something real. That's an opportunity. It's a provisional adaptation that the Selkie makes, right? She's good at it. She's a fine housewife. She has seven kids, but she's never, she's not totally ever in it. She's gazing longingly out to sea. And she has not forgotten that somewhere in that house, Mm -hmm. there is the seal skin. It's so interesting that he keeps it and it isn't destroyed because it's like, there's always this escape plan. You know, I know (laughs) people who are married, but they're always thinking about, well, I might leave. I might get divorced. They've got like one foot kind of out. It's like they they didn't quite make the full adaptation. (sighs) And, um, you know, she, she... she regresses. She goes back into an unconscious, undifferentiated state. I, I'm not so sure. Um, here's what I'm thinking about is that in the tales, her skin is stolen. So I'm thinking about theft as a psychological process, mm-hmm. uh, that the man steals the skin. And and how does that happen inside a, a woman, uh, inside all of us, uh, that, that something has to be stolen that forces us uh, into that next stage of life where we're, you know, as a young woman, you know, it's appropriate, uh, you know, c- come 
come down to earth or come up onto earth <laughs> um, and and deal with realities of householding, child rearing, etc. And that that's appropriate, but that it's experienced as a theft of of oh my gosh, I I didn't I didn't really know what I was going to be getting into. So how do you think that is an inner process? What's what's your thought about that? Well, I think it might work the same way from uh, you know the the masculine element in the story who you know falls in love and is besotted. You know he he escaped the blandishments of the regular women on land, but something wonderful, mystical, and magical happens when he sees women come up from the sea and shed their skins. And uh, so there's that spark that is lit in him uh, suddenly of desire. And I think there's a spark that is lit in, in women. And a lot of the tales say, well, you know, the woman, woman accedes, you know, she doesn't say, Hey, you better give me my skin back or else, you know, you're, you're really dead meat and I'm going to get you. Um, I'm going to fight you for it. Uh, she accedes because there is something in her too that yearns for her inner opposite of of being on the land, uh, the opposite of the sea, and doing that hard work. Um, and yet uh, she doesn't know what it is she's really chosen. There's So there's a theme here also of innocence, of... Mm. Uh, that when that spark is lit of feeling the pull, the yearning for the other, for the inner opposite, for what it is time for you to do in life, uh, there, there's also that cost later of like, wow, I, I didn't know uh, mm. that, that it was going to be like this, that it would <clears throat> last so long and be so hard and and dry me out psychologically. Mm -hmm. And I will add to this that, you know, in the, in the external world, we lived in Brooklyn for many years. And one of the things that I saw every single day that was kind of heartbreaking, uh, were women and men pushing little kids, uh, preschoolers, in strollers, because that's how you can get somewhere rapidly. You put the kid in the stroller and off you go uh, to preschool. And uh, nobody ever looked happy. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever looked like, well, you know, here we are. I'm, it's another day and I'm, and I'm up for my day. It was like, okay, I got up. We got everybody ready. I packed the lunch. I dressed my kid. I put my kid in the stroller. I'm on the clock, I've got to get this kid here, and then I'm going to get on the subway and go to work. Uh, it does dry us out, mm -hmm. and it is hard. Yeah. Well, if we think, uh, again, as we were saying, in a more uh, archetypal, psychological perspective, the, the sailor, the male figure on the shore, represents also the ego inside of the consciousness. The sulky represents the soul. And at a certain point, developmentally, the ego becomes strong enough to lay hold of the powers of the soul. And again, this is that process of adaptation. That it's natural for the ego to look into the unconscious and see something beautiful, amazing, mm -hmm. magical inside of the unconscious, to want to be in union with this remarkable possibility, and then finds a way to do this. The stealing from the standpoint of the ego seems reasonable. It, it may have a cost to it. Mm -hmm. All writers, for instance, stand at the shores with their keyboards. They stare into the water. <laughs> Is that how it's done? catching glimpses of ideas <laughs> and themes. And if they're lucky, you know, some figure literally puts a beautiful, big-eyed, seal-like 
face forward and, <laughs> and their fingers are off and running. If they're lucky, it'll come to the shore and unzip the seal skin and a really amazing story will happen. Wow. <clears throat> and that creative process is both a description of the creative process, but also the ego wants access to what is miraculous in the unconscious and is very likely mm. to take the seal skin and say, wait mm -hmm. a minute, you're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Muse, writing muse, mm -hmm. you know, artwork muse, yeah. architecture muse. Yeah. That, Can I just make something explicit, Joseph, mm -hmm. because you're doing something that I think is really interesting, but I want to flag it because yeah, yeah. you've moved into an interpretation of the tale as if it's from the psyche of the crofter. You're saying he's the ego and she's the soul, which I think works. Um, before we were talking about the tale as if it were from the psyche of the Selkie. And, and I, I'd love for us to spend more time talking about what this would mean if we were interpreting it as the crofter is the ego, the Selkie mm -hmm. is the soul, because we would say, I, I think you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. And so, so what do we do from there? He's, he's, he's seized it but you can never really control the soul is it something like that you might have seven beautiful children but eventually the soul is going to go its own way what what would you what further would you do with that joseph yeah well i i was thinking actually from um an older jungian tradition which is more like eric neumann's work mm -hmm. in the origins of consciousness where from that archetypal level the ego can be seen in general as having masculine qualities in as much as most of our egos are purposive, mm -hmm. they're separating out from the unconscious, they have agendas, yep. they make decisions, and that the ocean is the unconscious, the great feminine, and with all kinds of marvelous and treacherous effects upon the ego. So. Yes, if we were to think of it as a, solely a dream interpretation, we would pay a lot of uh, attention to gender. If we think about it from a much more collective standpoint, as perhaps von Franz and Neumann did, that the male on the shore is all of our egos, mm -hmm. that all of us can't yes, live in the it's, ocean it's sort of mythological <laughs> it shows this right i'm right i'm, I'm not yeah. no, i'm not let me just clarify i'm not saying oh this is a man and this is a woman i'm more saying whose experience are we centering in the tale the crofter or the selkie just to sure. see to imagine how the parts mm -hmm. relate to each one another but sure. I, I completely agree we could each be the crofter trying yes. to have that relationship with the selkie absolutely that's what I was leaning into at mm -hmm. that moment, although you've brought forward, I think, a good complexity is we could hold this as a dream in a woman's psyche, a man's psyche, or a collective dream that talks about the psychological organs mm -hmm. and how they yeah. function in human yes. beings in general. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think that I'd slipped into that without um, providing enough of a frame. So mm -hmm. I appreciate the clarification. But I think all of our listeners, we are standing on the shore and we are looking into the unconscious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there are contents in yeah. the unconscious that we long for. Yes. That's why we go to dream school. That's why we write our dreams down. That's why we contemplate our inner fantasies. Because all of those inner fantasies, like Selkies, are swimming around mm -hmm in us beckoning looking like all kinds of interesting things mm -hmm. and if we're lucky enough something that is very other in the psyche will anthropomorphize and then the waking personality can have perhaps a miraculous relationship mm -hmm. now the process of stealing the skin or taking the skin so that the ego at least fantasizes that it will now have a permanent union with mm -hmm. this quality in the unconscious, this miraculous wildness. 
this being that is half in the water and half on the land. And in the naivete of the uninitiated ego, we all believe that we can then just put our creative forces to the task, that we can take the libido, for instance, mm-hmm. the deep oceanic parts of ourselves, and say, okay, come on, let's, let's do this, yes, let's right. do that. Let's put it yeah. into the great engine of the first half of life. Mm. And what's remarkable, even in the fairy tale, is you know, it seems that in a rather human way, that can work for a while. It right. works until it yes. doesn't work. Yes, yeah. yes. But in, and in then a something way, wants to go back to the sea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But in a way, isn't that a kind of a developmental process? Right. That, um, you know, you, you made the analogy to dream school, but what, you know, we often are talking about in dream school is how to approach the unconscious with an attitude of, of respect and friendliness and openness, relatedness. So that would be as if in this story, the man saw all the women take uh, seals take their skins off and dance in the moonlight and then went up to them and said excuse me but um you know it's so magical and so lovely and what would one of you please deign to come and and uh, spend some time with me and my mm-hmm. <laughs> and, but the at that early first stage of life uh that ego part that's represented as the man the crofter has to take it and uh and that sets up a whole dynamic but that is often that first inner Mm -hmm. stage of development of the imperfect union Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that that something magical happens and then uh you know all of a sudden you're in it um and hopefully you know could grow into over time a, a more mature uh, kind of union where each partner has autonomy, fullness, has developed fully and relates very differently. Um, but I think it's very much a first stage of life story of mm. that you have to, to knuckle down, you have to make a commitment, you have to get real, you have to get a job, uh, it's, have a family and just deal and, Which goes and to it's not perfect. Mentioning, yes, mentioning the Puer and the Puella, that uh, we have to fish our potential out of the <laughs> unconscious or else we're just playing on the beach. And here in Virginia mm-hmm. Beach, there are entire cultures of uh, people in their 40s and 50s whose primary life is still surfing mm-hmm. all day, even in the winter. Right. Perhaps holding provisional jobs to allow that to be so. Mm -hmm. I have, over the many years, befriended one or two of these people, and I find them much like Selkies, you know? Mm -hmm. It's kind of remarkable to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And the joy with which they experience this, and when they talk about the ocean, I've never heard anybody talk about the ocean with such intimacy, when its dangers and the incredible alertness that lifelong surfers have. That's not to say that everybody that loves surfing lives a provisional life. Mm -hmm. But those who are committed to staying in a selkie form Mm -hmm. don't venture far. And there are wonderful gifts from that and so much that does not manifest on dry land. That's right. So... I just want to make it clear that we're we're considering all of these different ways of looking at the tale, and they're all valid. So mm-hmm. we're we're just kind of throwing up different ways to understand it. I'm going to do something now that Marie Louise von Franz often does: is when she's looking at tales, she'll pull in tales with similar themes to compare and mm-hmm. contrast to kind of sharpen the focus on the tale we're looking at. So I really quickly want to bring up a tale called the Swan Maiden. Um, And I'm just going to tell it really quickly. So there was a hunter, and he was, uh, you know, at dusk by a lake, and he watched these 12 swans um, land, and then they came ashore, and 
stepped out of their feathered robes, and there were twelve beautiful young maidens. And he noticed that the youngest and the, the smallest was the prettiest. So he knew which robe was hers. He picked it up, and she became his wife and stayed with him, and they had kids and that kind of thing. And then when the daughter reached adolescence, uh, she was in the attic, and she came downstairs and she said, Mother, what is this feathered robe doing here? Uh, and the mother said, um, I must leave you now, but tell your father to come look for me east of the sun and west of the moon. Mm. So it's like once having seen the feathered robe again, she doesn't have a choice, but she has to leave. But she does have a choice to tell her daughter, Here's, tell him to come find me. So she, there, she, she goes away. The husband comes home. The hunter comes home, realizes what has happened. The daughter lets him know. And he goes off and looks for her. He has all kinds of um, trials and tribulations and that kind of thing. But at the end, he comes to the palace of the Swan King. And he mm. says, I'm married to your youngest daughter. And the Swan King says, you, have to, you, ha you must know her. You have to pick her out. So mm. these 12 swans come out. You know, basically, if you, can, if you can identify her, then you can have her. Mm -hmm. So these 12 swans come out and, you know, swans all look pretty much alike, you know, <laughs> um, but he looks at, and this is a kind of paradox in the tale because he looks at her fingers, which swans don't have fingers, but just roll with me here for a minute. And the, the fingers of the youngest swan sister had calluses on them from the ah. sewing needle mm. where the, the swan maiden or the swan wife had been darning the children's clothing. And that's how he recognized her. And then he brought her back home and they were reunited. So the thing about this tale is there is a transformation. She has changed. She starts off as a swan. And by the end, she's been marked as an individual. She has become unique. The selkie, he doesn't pick out a single selkie. He just grabs whichever skin. And she goes back into the water and, again, is undifferentiated. But this is a complete, meaningful psychological transformation where she becomes a unique individual because of the toil that's associated with being a mother. So I, I think one way to look at these stories is the Selkie is a sort of incomplete individuation, and the Swan Maiden shows what it looks like when, it's, when there is a, a real personal transformation. Mm -hmm. it, I am especially appreciating the relational component uh, in, in the psyche that the, the man, the ego, uh, recognizes. Right. right. Uh, it, it's not un, undifferentiated in that part of the psyche that the, the ego has been observing and knowing uh, his wife and, and knowing that uh, he could pick her out by the calluses mm -hmm. on, on her fingers. Uh, uh, and uh, isn't that a great, it's a great um, image of the relationship between the ego and the psyche. Of, mm -hmm. of does, you know, whether uh, in, in the Selkie stories where the man just takes a skin and just pick one, just take a skin. Mm -hmm. Uh, versus, uh, I have chosen this one, and I've gotten to know her, and I can recognize her. I see her. You know that could be, you know, in the outer world, a a real relationship between two people, and in the inner world, of the relationship between the ego and the unconscious. That I have discriminated i have taken the time mm -hmm. and the trouble to see to recognize to differentiate uh it is a wonderful image for uh how the ego can best relate to psyche yeah it reminds me of the difference between in fairy tales and myths when a human being is cursed to be in an animal form and the 
process that has to happen mm. to be released versus a truly magical creature that belongs in both worlds and is true to itself. Mm -hmm. uh, the Selkie is its own order of being, although there are some Scottish tales that Selkies may be the souls of despondent people who had committed suicide in the mm -hmm. sea or, mm -hmm. or lost at the sea. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, as I was reading about it, they are simply considered an order of being, much like the fairy folk. Mm -hmm. And even within that, there are several differences. The fin folk are any of the humanoid figures that reside in the water, of course, that have fins, but more fish-like. They're considered very dangerous. Mermaids mm -hmm. and mer women sometimes meld with the Selkies, but have something to do with that Greco-Roman influence in Scotland and mm -hmm. Ireland. The Selkie is something that seems more ancient and is eternally magical. So I find myself now wondering about the ego and its relationship to the collective unconscious and how dynamic or how dangerous that may be. Mm. You know, we talk about the dangers of archetypal possession, that the ego can wind up too close to an archetypal force and put it at risk overwhelm it, leave it in some difficult state. But we rarely talk about the danger or diminishment to the archetype if it is pulled forward, trapped, and claimed in a certain fashion. And I'm wondering if the tale thinking in a very broad way, has to do with the transition in these Celtic cultures from their natural indigenous pagan beliefs into Christianity mm. and from Christianity into the modern world mm. where the magical creatures, mm. just like the Queen of Sheba, whose bottom half was a goat, have to be stripped of these otherworldly components. Mm. The skins have to be hidden or imprisoned, and that the images have to be secularized, that sulkies aren't real. We're just going to take the skins off them and turn them into wives and maidens and neighbors. And we're just going to hide away that mystical, uncanny dimension of the psyche and make everything rational, scientific, ordinary, mm -hmm. non-bizarre, mm -hmm. to hide the uncanny away. And what I like about the tale that you told is that the skin wasn't destroyed but it was only hidden. This goes in part to Jung's idea that the gods being deprived of their status in a mythic religious sense then live inside of us and become symptoms. Mm -hmm. That the archetypal mm -hmm. forces then start doing strange things in our physical bodies and even in our cultural bodies making strange tensions move around in the culture in ways that we can't understand. And so something magical, again, has been stripped from its 
magical, mythical religious dimension and made ordinary, put in service to the culture. Mm-hmm. Here are the rules, here are the roles, this is what people mm-hmm. do. And when that occurs, a drying out yeah. happens. That there's a, a lack of moisture. There's a lack of magic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's an attack on enchantment itself. <laughs> yeah. And what yeah, was magical starts to wither. Mm-hmm. Right. I think that's really just a very brilliant way of looking at this, you know, really different. And that's the great thing about fairy tales and, and this tale in particular is that there's so many ways to look at it. And, you know, that, that process of sort of the attack on enchantment, I mean, that definitely mm. is a process that happens at the cultural level, it has ha- been going on for years and years. I'm thinking again of Ian McGilchrist, you know, um, the master and his emissary. Um and it happens on the personal level too, right? Because there is a time when we leave magic behind. You know, kids mm-hmm. when they're eight or so, they they start realizing that the tooth fairy is really their parent and Santa Claus doesn't really exist. And and even as you grow up, there is this there is this loss of magic. I mean, I, I see a lot of young people on the threshold of adulthood and it's 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 a daunting precipice to be on because it doesn't look like it's so much fun to be an adult because there's no magic to it you know um and and to a certain extent to become a mature adult we do have to lose the magic but of course ideally we come into a different relationship with it we realize that it's an internal process that the world is awake and alive and full of magic but we have to find our own interior way of relating to that. And some of us mm-hmm. can't or have great difficulty doing so. Yeah. And in the fairy tale or the folk tale, the thing that is left behind is the child. And one might say that the purpose of the in, entire fairy tale, if it were thought of as collective, is the production of the child that is part mythic, and part human, and acts as a bridge Mm -hmm. between the enchanted world and the world as it is, just as children do. Yeah. I mean, maybe the child is every child that still sees Selkies and goes to kindergarten, that they live in both places. Yeah. But I think perhaps as a symbol of the psyche that has undergone this loss of enchantment and then the re-enchantment as the sulky finds her way back into the water is left with some new version of the ego. Mm -hmm. The divine child or the child that remembers that it is half magic. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I'm um, I'm appreciating that you know where the new thing is is often imaged in the psyche as a child, and uh, and that in these tales it's uh, one of the children who comes and says, you know, Mom, I found this swan robe up in the attic. What do you what do you know about that? Or you know, guess what? I know where this skin is. How come Dad keeps this old thing out in the garage? Um, so, so the child is very important and there's a lovely, lovely movie called the, the tale of Rowan Inish. And in this story, uh, a child has been lost and there is another child, the grandchild and the grandparents and the people who live on the land are dried out. Uh, they're good, kind, loving people, and it is the child who sees, the child who sees, uh, and they image it in the movie as uh, that this baby is still alive and out there on the island that they have had to evacuate, and goes back out there and create. You know, they they renovate the old cottage and. 
uh, eventually there's a reuniting and it's all very concretized in the movie, but as a, as a mythical theme that it is the child who bridges both realms and who is the healing force for the adults uh, in the tale of that the liminal space, the magical enchanted space, and what we might say is, is our interior psychic space, the place in us that is alive, that has moisture where we, where we can swim, where we can be free, that there's a place uh, where, where that too uh, can be present and, and unite the realms. I'm I'm wondering I'm I'm wanting to sort of see if we can ground this in the experience of an individual and I'm I'm thinking of some friends that I have so maybe I'll just uh, spin a yarn here for a second. Um so uh, I'm I'm friends with the woman and she's uh, very accomplished and uh, really educated and she didn't get married for a while she really wanted someone and then she met this guy who was very charming. And, uh, but you know, a little, a little lost and he had been really struggling with something at the time that they met and she kind of took him under her wing and, uh, he, he was amenable to that. And, uh, you know, she, she kind of coaxed, coaxed him into getting married Mm. and, uh, for a little while things seemed, you know, good. Um, but then she started getting frustrated because he really never kind of picked himself back up and really got out there in the world and made anything of himself. And she was supporting them. And uh, he started kind of uh, um, pulling at the reins a little bit because he didn't really appreciate the, you know, being being confined by the expectations of his role as husband. and. Uh, he he strayed a little bit, and uh, eventually, you know, it, it fell apart. And I think, you know, I can think about this tale as, you know, he's this the man is the selkie. He he mm-hmm. had an opportunity, and and you could look at it as you know provided by the outer person, but also provided by life's events. I mean, he he'd sort of had a uh, a, a real a, a real difficult thing happen to him. He was in a bit of a kind of night sea journey, and. Um, that could have been a wake up call for him to grow up, grow himself up, mm-hmm. put some roots down, become become someone. And instead he kind of let himself be rescued by her and uh, and wasn't really happy with that. So when he left, he just sort of went back to the life he was living before, more or less. Um, so, you know, I, I think that this kind of sulky psychology can turn up in any of us. I, I think we've all felt felt it. Um, we may choose to do something different with it than what happens in the fairy tale, but I think it's really universal. Yeah. And that's part of the appeal of the story. So it was a good time, it seems, to transition to a dream. And uh, before we do that, I'm just going to put in a word and a reminder about dream school. Uh, I wish I could come up with an analogy to uh, here's your selkie opportunity, but it really (laughs) is to swim in the depths of of psyche. And... uh, that that's our own deep interior. That's where there is an inner other. That's the treasure hard to attain, as Jung said, and the inner companion. So uh, all I'm asking you to do is just go online, uh, thisjungianlife.com, and just tap on Dream School. Uh, some wonderful images and some little descriptions, and just see what happens inside you. And if your um, inner selkie, I think I'm pushing this, but if your inner selkie says, yes, 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 please come back to the water, then come on board and join us in dream school. So 
Uh, with that, um, our dreamer this week is a woman. She's 63 years old, and she's in Environmental Health Administration. And she's titled her dream, Fake Prospero's Advice. And here's the dream. I dreamt I requested to present to local government an opportunity to help people out with repair and replacement of septic tanks if they couldn't afford it, including replacement caps to prevent toddlers from falling in and drowning. The chief executive, an inexperienced and clueless fellow, introduced me to their new consultant who looked just like the guy who played Prospero in my senior year production of The Tempest in college when I played Caliban. The guy was really good looking but was a terrible actor who had never studied and couldn't seem to memorize his lines. As the consultant to our local government, he informed me that in order to make any assistance possible for people in need, I'd have to first make a public presentation pledging I would worship Thanatos and Eros, and that I would only award assistance to those who swore their religious allegiance to Thanatos and Eros. I was outraged and stomped out. My friend, who is in the same field and with whom I often collaborate, was sitting in the audience calmly taking notes. I asked her if she would do it, and she said she didn't see any problem with it, which I thought was completely out of character, as she is a very principled woman who stands up to anything unethical. I woke up angry and a little confused. For context, our dreamer says, I recently left a job I loved in local government after almost three decades because of a change in leadership to one I considered vapid, incompetent, and deeply unethical. I am in a new position where I might be able to help my community that I love, but would then have to cooperate with people I consider corrupt. The main feelings in the dream were anger, indignation, outrage, and some confusion and deflation. Usually, I wake up laughing from dreams because mine are funny and filled with silly paradoxes. So this one stood out. And for additional context, she adds, Prospero is a father figure. In this case, the consultant reminded me of someone I knew in college who was incredibly handsome but couldn't act or be bothered to memorize his lines. He was really shallow. Eros and Thanatos would be gods of eroticism and death, quite an odd combo to worship as I am Jewish and next week is Rosh Hashanah. Uh, the woman taking notes, <laughs> sorry, um, I don't have the rest of that sentence. I, I can do it. Um, the woman taking notes is someone I often conspire with to do good things, despite the slow-moving bureaucracies in which we exist. Everything was gray and brownish colors I associate with depression, anxiety, death, and septic tanks. So now our listeners know that I send out the dream to Deb and <laughs> Joseph every morning, and they print it, and uh, yeah, that's, that's our mm -hmm. workflow. So. And her, her final words are, I often conspire to do good things despite the slow-moving bureaucracies in which we exist, and that in the dream everything was gray and brownish, colors that she associates with depression, anxiety, death, and septic tanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to just jump right on in. <laughs> I figured you would have tank? a lot to say about this one, Joseph. <laughs> <laughs> this is such a great dream. This is a total Joseph dream. <laughs> well, um, although she doesn't put this in the context, this is a remarkable Freudian dream. In every regard. <laughs> really? Absolutely. Because the great Freudian tension was between Eros and Thanatos, okay. between life and death. Okay. Mm -hmm. Those were the two great drives mm -hmm. that human beings were struggling with. That Freud was, of course, aligned with life, with Eros, with relatedness, 
and to stand against the death urge. And in the beginning, what we see is very much Freud's concern that the human ego, when it is innocent and young, can fall into the id, can fall into the great cesspool of dangerous, life-killing impulses, which Freud was very frightened of, and he saw World War II as the worst example of the destructive dimension of human psyche. Mm. And his great quest, and very much his daughter's quest, Sonna Freud, is how do you cap off mm. the worst parts of human behavior so that civilization can survive, so that the ego can create and move mm. forward? So we also have a wonderful Jung Freud parallel that this woman, much like Jung, has been put in this place where you must swear allegiance to death and eros, mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. libido sexual theory. That you must do that <laughs> in order to move forward. And like Jung, she says, hell no, I yeah. think it's more than that. Uh -huh. And it's unethical. When we think about Prospero and Caliban, by the way, the story of the Tempest, we could put that in very easy Freudian terms, that Prospero is this well-cultured, civilized ego, and mm -hmm. Caliban is the id. <laughs> um, Ariel is the superego. Mm -hmm. And so the containment of Caliban's impulses to rape, Prospero's daughter, which happens very subtly in The Tempest, but it is insinuated, mm -hmm. is also part of this entire dimension. So, I know it sounds very abstracting, but it fits so well that it just, I found it kind of stunning. So, one of the things I love about doing this podcast with you guys is like, I knew you'd have something to say about the stream. I would not in a million years have known that you were going to say that. Like, I, I don't have known you for like over 20 years, and I still cannot see things totally through your eyes. It's great. Um, that is totally not where I went with this stream. <laughs> But I had this, I was also sort of salivating. I was like, oh man, I, this is great. You know, um, I, I really like the idea of the septic, sep, septic caps as kind of repression, which is great. I think that's a great image. I was really struck by the attitude of the dream ego in this dream. So the dream ego is sure she's right. We've got these feelings of anger and outrage which, you know, I think usually when the dream ego feels anger and outrage, it's a little bit of a flag that we might be, um, I'm going to say, defending against some content or ad new attitude that's in the unconscious. It's like the ego, the ego thinks that she's got this all figured out and that she knows what's what. And in fact, this um, kind of, this sort of Prospero guy um, he is uh, bringing something new. He is bringing the new attitude. He's the kind of telos in the dream, as it were. The ego is kind of doing what the ego always does. She's in work mode. But he's saying you have to worship these larger forces. You have to kind of pay attention to the archetypal world. You have to note that we are motivated by, by love and by death and invokes these huge archetypes. And she rejects it out of hand. She feels like it's unethical. And again, I think whenever the, whenever the ego is kind of angry, especially when we wake up sort of angry, you know, it's like, what, what are you doing to me? It's like, hmm, I wonder if there's something in there that we need to pay attention to. And I would, I would say that that is further strengthened by the appearance of her friend, who would be a shadow figure, who says, yeah, this is good. It's like some part of the psyche knows that she might be overvaluing the impulse to do good things, to be out in the outer world doing good things and making presentations. And, and it's kind of saying, what about the inner world? What about the invisible world of the archetypes? Can you, 
can you get interested in your interiority as well? So that's my kind of quick hit on it. I've got more to say, but I'll stop mm-hmm. for now. Well, this, this is a great illustration <laughs> in um, how many different ways there are, how many different lenses through which to see a dream. Yeah. Uh, I was moved by the very, very first part of the dream that uh, she requested to present to local government an opportunity to help people out with repair and replacement of septic tanks if they couldn't afford it, including replacement of caps to prevent toddlers from falling in and drowning. Uh, And I have wondered if this is a dream about the collective. Mm. Of that, um, you know... You mentioned Joseph about you know Freud and his uh, how he saw World War II and certainly Jung did uh, with both World War One and World War II that uh, you know what is happening to our processing as a collective of of waste and is it safe and does it need to be kept uh, much as our uh, impulsive and destructive and immature uh, instincts need to be capped. There's a place for them uh, in the septic tank to process waste material appropriately, uh, and we don't want it open to the external world where our young energy, our young innocent and 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 future energy children are often symbols of the future and we don't want them to be that part to be in in danger and that then as the dream goes on she's given this the our poor dream ego here um is given the choice to have to worship thanatos and eros um and even though, you know, in a way that sort of promises kind of a unification of the opposites of worship, both love and death, uh, it's also an either-or construct. You either, you either do this and comply, or you don't. Uh, so I agree with everything that you guys have said, and I wonder if uh, this is also a dream about our collective uh, dilemmas. And she's dreaming for all of us, and sometimes that happens that we dream for everybody. Um, I want to just sort of add, I think that's really interesting, Deb. Um, You know, the the Prospero figure in the dream is a little bit of a trickster, Hmm. you know, because, because of the relationship with this guy from college who was good looking, but could sort of, I guess, try to skate by on his, on his good looks. So that's, that's another interesting thing that, that somehow the, the new thing is kind of slipping in, in through these values that are definitely, you can tell that, you know, this is a very conscientious person, I have no doubt. And she, she had no patience for this guy who wasn't willing to learn his lines. So the, the ego has this certain orientation to the world, but there are other values too. There are other possible ways to do things. Sometimes it does work to be a little bit slippery or a little bit tricky. Mm. And what important values might come through into consciousness through that part of the denied personality? The other thing is that I think we're all interested in the sewer and the sewer caps, <laughs> and I think both of you have said really good things about it. Um, But you could look at sewer as kind of being the prima materia in alchemy. You know, it is it is literally the filth, and we know that that's where you find the philosopher's stone. So you wouldn't you would want to cap it to keep young, immature aspects of the psyche from drowning in it. But it it might be important to also be able to get access to it at times. So I wonder if and Joseph, I think I'm picking up on on your speculation about the sewer caps is kind of an image of repression i mean if if you're very uh if you're very keen on keeping the powers of the interior at bay you would want to cap that sewer and not know about thanatos and eros 
and you'd want to just be focused in the world about sort of doing good things. I, I think the context of the dream is interesting because, you know, she, she left this job after she found that she couldn't, you know, kind of work with these mm -hmm. people who she felt were, were not handling things the right way. And that's really admirable. And, um, and, and, and is it possible that there's a certain kind of rigidity there because yeah. there, there isn't enough kind of dream prospero or there isn't enough, mm -hmm. there isn't enough access to the sewer. I mean, you, uh, or the septic. You, you you need to keep it capped. I'm, I'm not I'm not denying that. Um, but but somehow sometimes we we need a, a little bit of access to that because that's that's where the new growth is. And so, the dream ego is defending against any change. Maybe. Yeah, it appears that way. The uh, change of internal organization, internal leadership is shifting and the dream ego is not going to have it. That she doesn't respect this version of her animus, thinks of him as, as too mercurial. And Prospero is a magician, so we're in mm -hmm. the world of Mercury. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to get his lines right I mean, that's, that's one of the associations there, that he isn't going to play his role. Right. Because he isn't going to spend enough time to know what his role is. Or he might have to improvise. Improvise, and, and something about the dream ego, uh, and perhaps the uh, profession of being in an environmental health administration may very well be that she's a scientist, which has worked very well for her, and she has a very precise scientific way of understanding things and so if intuition begins to come in through the animus it can be very hard to find that valid mm -hmm. to make sense of it and just as you had said these archetypal dynamics that are being invited in now the listener is obviously listening to this Jungian Life podcast right we're talking about archetypes all the time yes and yet on the unconscious mind, yeah, she's, Joseph, very, she's not listening to this Freudian life, okay? No, she's not. <laughs> um, you know, uh, feels rather suspicious, although from a Freudian perspective, she could kind of take refuge. She could separate out from the more kind of mystical sounding things mm -hmm. that Jung wrote. The thing that is also significant for me is that there is a shadow figure inside of her, the friend who's just taking it all in stride. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Thanatos, Eros, oh, well, you know, I'll just jump in there and get to know them, and Prosperos, you know, seems to be fine, and, you know, big changes are occurring. And there is a part of her that is able to be relaxed, curious, unflapped about yeah. a big change of internal administration, mm -hmm. while the dream ego is highly agitated yeah. and angry, but there is another potential that's just quietly sitting right next to her, just hanging mm -hmm. out, looking mm -hmm. at what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I've wondered if um, I'm going back to the construct of either or, and I'm wondering, I'm thinking about how that plays out again and again uh, in the dream and in the context that she supplied to us of that she was working for a place and it was you know for her it was unethical or unprincipled and she left um then there is this uh command uh that to to worship and give a public presentation on on thanatos and eros which might be a theme of you know sort of uh, unification integration uh, but it's as, you know, you do this or else, either you do it or you don't. Um, and she's still in this, uh, another sort of slow, slow moving uh, bureaucracy. And again, it's sort of like, do I put up with this and go along with it or do I not? And the shadow figure in the audience uh, is an image of just take it in and calmly take notes 
but I'm also wondering about whether there's a call here for the trickster, mm -hmm. uh, for the Prospero energy mm -hmm. of, is it all either you comply or you, you have to rebel or protest or leave or, or is there some other sort of fun trickstery mm -hmm. way to play with, with yeah. this a little bit? Uh, to be a little, a little irreverent. Well, along those lines, it's important that her association is that in senior year, she played Caliban. Mm. <laughs> yes, that's right. So it, it is a return to the instinctive, to the unconscious, to the, to the magical, the, mystical, because yeah. Caliban is, mm -hmm. is, like Ariel is a creature between the worlds. Mm -hmm. um, it's not quite clear if he's human. In the Tempest, he may be some earth elemental, just as Ariel flies and is some kind of a, an angel, a spirit of the air. But they are these elemental beings that Prospero has tethered to his will and has made them his servants in this magical island. So there is something inside of her that is primal, causing perhaps problem, perhaps that primality requires this extremely ethical, principled, organized, mm -hmm. role-centric compensation, which may have served her very, very well for quite some time. But much as we were saying in the episode on the Selkie, it seems that enchantment is knocking at the door. Yes. Yes, that's a good way. Magic to has arrived. That's, that's a good way to sum up the stream, I think. I'll just say, just to get the last word in, um, I'm curious. I would, I would be curious about her relationship with her father because she lifts up that Prospero, Prospero is a father figure. And so hmm, that makes me curious. You've been listening to This Jungian Life, from our website, thisunionlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this union life.